Alien is a 1979 science fiction horror film directed by Ridley Scott and written by Dan O'Bannon. The plot of the movie goes as follows. The commercial space tug Nostromo is returning to Earth with a seven-member crew in stasis. The ship's computer detects a transmission from a nearby moon and awakens the crew. Following company policy to investigate any transmissions, they land on the moon and Dallas, Kane and Lambert head out to investigate the signal's origin. The party discovers that it is from a derelict alien spaceship. Inside, they find the remains of a large alien with a hole in its torso. Mother later deciphers part of the transmission, which Ripley determines is actually a warning message. Kane discovers a chamber containing hundreds of large eggs. When he touches one, a creature springs out, penetrates his helmet, and attaches itself to his face. Dallas and Lambert carry the unconscious Kane back to the Nostromo. While studying cinema at the University of Southern California, Dan O'Bannon had made a science fiction comedy film, Dark Star, with director John Carpenter and concept artist Ron Cobb, with production beginning in late 1970. The film featured an alien which was played for the comedic effect. The experience left O'Bannon wanting to do an alien that looked real. A couple of years later he began work on a similar story that would focus more on horror. I knew I wanted to do a scary movie on a spaceship with a small number of astronauts. Ronald Shusett, meanwhile, was working on an early version of what would eventually become Total Recall. Impressed by Dark Star, he contacted O'Bannon, and the two agreed to collaborate on their projects, choosing to work on O'Bannon's film first, as they believed it would be less costly to produce. O'Bannon had written 29 pages of a script titled Memory, containing what would become the opening scenes of Alien. A crew of astronauts awakens to find that their voyage has been interrupted because they are receiving a signal from a mysterious planetoid. They investigate and their ship breaks down on the surface. He did not yet have a clear idea as to what the alien antagonist of the story would be. O'Bannon soon accepted an offer to work on an adaptation of Dune, a project that took him to Paris for six months. Though the project ultimately fell through, it introduced him to several artists whose work gave him ideas for his science fiction story including Chris Foss, H.R. Geiger, and Jean Giraud, known as Mobius. O'Bannon was impressed by Foss's covers for science fiction books, while he found Geiger's work to be disturbing. His paintings had a profound effect on me. I had never seen anything that was quite as horrible and at the same time as beautiful as his work. And so I ended up writing a script about a Geiger monster. After the Dune project collapsed, O'Bannon returned to Los Angeles, and with Shusett, the two revived his memory script. Shusett suggested that O'Bannon use one of his other film ideas about gremlins infiltrating a B-17 bomber during World War II and set it on the spaceship as the second half of the story. The working title of the project was now Star Beast, but O'Bannon disliked this and changed it to Alien after noting the number of times that the word appeared in the script. Shusett and O'Bannon liked the new title's simplicity and its double meaning as both a noun and an adjective. Shusett came up with the idea that one of the crew members could be implanted with an alien embryo that would burst out of him. He thought this would be an interesting plot device by which the alien could get aboard the ship. Can you leave a decision like that to Ash? Listen, I just fly this thing. Anything that has to do with science division, Ash has the last word. Yeah, how the hell does that happen? It happens all the time. Directions from the company. Since when is that standard procedure? Standard procedure is you do what they tell you to do. Besides, I don't know nothing about science, but I do know about flying. Did you ship out with Ash before? Nope. First time. I did five hauls with a science man before, but a couple of days before we took off there... O'Bannon put his finger on the problem. What has to happen next is the creature has to get on the ship in an interesting way. I have no idea how, but if we could solve that, if it can't be that it just snuck in, 
then I think the whole movie will come into place. Shusit woke up in the middle of the night with the solution. Dan, I think I have an idea. The alien screws one of them. It jumps on his face and plants its seed. In writing the script, O'Bannon drew inspiration from many previous works of science fiction and horror. He later stated, I didn't steal Alien from anybody. I stole it from everybody. The Thing from Another World 1951 inspired the idea of professional men being pursued by a deadly alien creature through a claustrophobic environment. Forbidden Planet 1956 gave O'Bannon the idea of a ship being warned not to land, and then the crew being killed one by one by a mysterious creature when they defy the warning. Planet of the Vampires 1965 contains a scene in which the heroes discover a giant alien skeleton. This influenced the Nostromo crew's discovery of the alien creature in the derelict spacecraft. O'Bannon has also noted the influence of Junkyard 1953, a short story by Clifford Simak in which a crew lands on an asteroid and discovers a chamber full of eggs. He has also cited as influences Strange Relations by Philip Farmer 1960, which covers alien reproduction and various EC Comics horror titles carrying stories in which monsters eat their way out of people. With most of the plot in place, Shusit and O'Bannon presented their script to several studios, pitching it as Jaws in Space. They were on the verge of signing a deal with Roger Corman's studio when a friend offered to find them a better deal and passed the script on to Gordon Carroll, David Geiler and Walter Hill, who had formed a production company called Brandywine with ties to 20th Century Fox. O'Bannon and Shusit signed a deal with Brandywine, but Hill and Geiler were not satisfied with the script and made numerous rewrites and revisions. This caused tension with O'Bannon and Shusit, since Hill and Geiler had very little experience with science fiction, according to Shusit. They weren't good at making it better, or in fact at not making it even worse. O'Bannon believed that Hill and Geiler were attempting to justify taking his name off the script and claiming Shusit's and his work as their own. Hill and Geiler did add some substantial elements to the story, including the android character Ash, which O'Bannon felt was an unnecessary subplot, but which Shusit later described as one of the best things in the movie. That whole idea and scenario was theirs. Hill and Geiler went through eight drafts of the script in total, concentrating largely on the Ash subplot, but also making the dialogue more natural and trimming some sequences set on the alien planetoid. Despite the fact that the final shooting script was written by Hill and Geiler, the Writers Guild of America awarded O'Bannon sole credit for the screenplay. Despite these rewrites, 20th Century Fox did not express confidence in financing a science fiction film. However, after the success of Star Wars in 1977, the studio's interest in the genre rose substantially, according to Carol. When Star Wars came out, and was the extraordinary hit that it was, suddenly science fiction became the hot genre. O'Bannon recalled that they wanted to follow through on Star Wars, and they wanted to follow through fast and the only spaceship script they had sitting on their desk was Alien. Alien was greenlit by 20th Century Fox, with an initial budget of $4.2 million. Hill and Geiler had been impressed by Ridley Scott's debut feature film The Duelists and made an offer to him to direct Alien, which Scott quickly accepted. Scott created detailed storyboards for the film in London, which impressed Fox enough to double the film's budget. His storyboards included designs for the spaceship and space suits, drawing on such films as 2001, A Space Odyssey and Star Wars. However, he was keen on emphasizing horror in Alien, rather than fantasy, describing the film as the Texas chain saw massacre of science fiction. Ridley Scott is his own storyboard artist and storyboards his films himself. When he was starting out, this was a rare skill for filmmakers to have and it points back to Scott's art school past. When was the first time you saw Giger's work? Well, I'd never come across Giger's work at all. I'd been vaguely aware, once I'd seen it, of some artwork I'd seen earlier for a record sleeve, I think. Brain salad surgery, right? And it wasn't until I got to Los Angeles and I then knew I was going to be involved in the film uh, the thing about all these films, all monster films, or whatever you'd like to call it, is that uh, uh, the danger is how on earth are you going to finally do it? How are you going to make it, okay? And so that was one of the big concerns about how on earth it was going to be carried out, who was going to actually design it and create it. 
and I was shown the book uh, Necro Necronomicon, okay, um, in Los Angeles. In fact, by O'Bannon, who brought it in, and I nearly fell off the desk. Said, "That's it," and uh, why look farther? And uh, so that's how I saw it. It was as simple as that. I've never been so certain about anything in my life. Alien was filmed over 14 weeks from July to October 1978. Principal photography took place at Shepperton Studios near London, while model and miniature filming was done at Bray Studios in Berkshire. The production schedule was short due to the film's low budget and pressure from 20th Century Fox to finish on time. A crew of over 200 craftspeople and technicians constructed the three principal sets. The surface of the alien planetoid and the interiors of the Nostromo and the derelict spacecraft. Art director Les Dilly created scale miniatures of the planetoid's surface and derelict spacecraft based on Geiger's designs, then made molds and casts and scaled them up as diagrams for the wood and fiberglass forms of the sets. Tons of sand, plaster, fiberglass, rock and gravel were shipped into the studio to sculpt a desert landscape for the planetoid's surface, which the actors would walk across wearing space suit costumes. The suits were thick, bulky and lined with nylon, had no cooling systems, and initially no venting for carbon dioxide to escape. Combined with a heat wave, these conditions nearly caused the actors to pass out. Nurses had to be kept on hand with oxygen tanks. For scenes showing the exterior of the Nostromo, a 58-foot landing leg was constructed to give a sense of the ship's size. Scott was not convinced that it looked large enough, so he had his two young sons and the son of the film's cinematographer stand in for the actors, wearing smaller space suits to make the set pieces seem larger. The same technique was used for the scene in which the crew members encounter the dead alien creature in the derelict spacecraft. The children nearly collapsed due to the heat of the suits. Oxygen systems were eventually added to help the actors breathe. My first question is, how did you initially get involved with Alien? For some bizarre reason, some bright spark was at the Cannes Film Festival and put two and two together, saw Julius and offered me Alien. You work that one out, I can't work that one out. But um, because I'd been uh, just discovering science fiction, if you like, at that point, th mainly through the uh, hands of Mobius, right, and uh, all those heavy metal comics, because um, I was thinking about doing something else. Uh, I was fairly brimming over with ideas and information from various sources of uh, graphic art, really. And so when somebody sent this alien script, um, I read it, and uh, I read it once, actually. And uh, at, that was in London, so I read it about, I think, finished about 10 o'clock in the morning. Uh, I was waiting, sitting on a chair, till Hollywood, uh, you know, Los Angeles woke up. And I called up immediately and said, uh, I'll do it, I'll do it. Alien originally was to conclude with the destruction of the Nostromo while Ripley escapes in the shuttle Narcissus. However, Scott conceived of a fourth act to the film in which the alien appears on the shuttle and Ripley is forced to confront it. He pitched the idea to 20th Century Fox and negotiated an increase in the budget to film the scene over several extra days. Scott had wanted the alien to bite off Ripley's head and then make the final log entry in her voice, but the producers vetoed this idea because they believed the alien should die at the end of the film. One scene that was cut from the film occurred during Ripley's final escape from the Nostromo. She encounters Dallas and Brett, who have been partially cocooned by the alien. O'Bannon had intended the scene to indicate that Brett was becoming an alien egg, while Dallas was held nearby to be implanted by the resulting facehugger. Production designer Michael Seymour later suggested that Dallas had become sort of food for the alien creature, while Ivor Powell suggested that Dallas is found in the ship as an egg, still alive. The scene was cut partly because it did not look realistic enough, but also because it slowed the pace of the escape sequence. Tom Skerritt remarked that the picture had to have that pace. Her trying to get the hell out of there, we're all rooting for her to get out of there, and for her to slow up and have a conversation with Dallas was not appropriate. The footage was included with other deleted scenes as a special feature on the Laserdisc release of Alien, and a shortened version of it was reinserted into the 2003 director's cut. 
O'Bannon introduced Scott to the artwork of H.R. Geiger. Both of them felt that his painting, Necronum 4, was the type of representation they wanted for the film's alien creature, and began asking the studio to hire him as a designer. Fox initially believed Geiger's work was too ghastly for audiences, but the Brandywine team were persistent and eventually won out. According to Gordon Carroll, the first second that Ridley saw Geiger's work, he knew that the biggest single design problem, maybe the biggest problem in the film, had been solved. Scott flew to Zurich to meet Geiger and recruited him to work on all aspects of the alien and its environment including the surface of the planetoid, the derelict spacecraft, and all four forms of the alien from the egg to the adult. The scene of Kane inspecting the egg was shot in post-production. A fiberglass egg was used so that actor John Hurt could shine his light on it and see movement inside, which was provided by Scott fluttering his hands inside the egg while wearing rubber gloves. The top of the egg was hydraulic and the innards were a cow's stomach and tripe. Test shots of the eggs were filmed using hen's eggs, and this footage was used in early teaser trailers. For this reason, the image of a hen's egg was used on the poster and has become emblematic of the franchise as a whole as opposed to the alien egg that appears in the finished film. The facehugger itself was the first creature that Geiger designed for the film, going through several versions in different sizes before deciding on a small creature with human-like fingers and a long tail. O'Bannon, with help from Ron Cobb, drew his own version based on Geiger's design which became the final version of the alien. Cobb came up with the idea that the creature could have a powerful acid for blood, a characteristic that would carry over to the adult alien and would make it impossible for the crew to kill it by conventional means, such as guns or explosives, since the acid would burn through the ship's hull. Uh, able to squeeze in as much as they have to with this kind of film. I'm not saying this applies to every kind of movie, but bearing in mind that alien really fundamentally is a well-done B-movie, right? That's what it is. And uh, so when I was told that we were liked on characterization later by some critic at the end of it, I told them basically, <laughs> off, right? <laughs> and so, are you kidding, uh, right? And uh, so I'd get that um, uh, constant questions from different actors who would be nameless within the, within the cast who'd say, what's my character, man? What's my motivation, man? And, uh, and so I thought the best thing to do was to sit down. I wrote a little bio on each of them, starting at birth through to mum, dad, university, training college, how they got into NASA, NASA projected into industry, industry to Whalen Utani, uh, finally having done Mars and Moon, yada, 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 yada. And you know what? They really loved that. And <laughs> I, didn't have, I never had to talk to them again except deal with the script. For the filming of the chestburster scene, the cast members knew that the creature would be bursting out of hurt and had seen the chestburster puppet, but they had not been told that fake blood would also be bursting out in every direction from high-pressure pumps and squibs. The scene was shot in one take using an artificial torso filled with blood and viscera, with Hurt's head and arms coming up from underneath the table. The chestburster was shoved up through the torso by a puppeteer who held it on a stick. When the creature burst through the chest, a stream of blood shot directly at Cartwright, shocking her enough that she fell over and went into hysterics. According to Tom Skerritt, what you saw on camera was the real response. She had no idea what the hell happened. For the scene in which Ash is revealed to be an android, a puppet was created of the character's torso and upper body, which was operated from underneath. During a preview screening of the film, this scene caused an usher to faint. In the following scene, Ash's head is placed on a table and reactivated. For portions of this scene, an animatronic head was made using a face cast of the actor Ian Holm. However, the latex of the head shrank while curing and the result was not entirely convincing. For the bulk of the scene, Holm knelt under the table with his head coming up through a hole. Milk, caviar, pasta, fiber optics, and urinary catheters were combined to form the android's innards. Geiger made several conceptual paintings of the adult alien before settling on the final version. He sculpted the creature's body using plasticine, incorporating pieces such as vertebrae from snakes and cooling tubes from a Rolls Royce. The creature's head was manufactured separately by Carlo Ramboldi, who had worked on the aliens in close encounters of the third kind. 
Rambaldi followed Geiger's designs closely, making some modifications to incorporate the moving parts that would animate the jaw and inner mouth. A system of hinges and cables was used to operate the creature's rigid tongue, which protruded from its mouth and featured a second mouth at its tip with its own set of movable teeth. The final head had about 900 moving parts and points of articulation. Part of a human skull was used as the face and was hidden under the smooth, translucent cover of the head. Rambaldi's original alien jaw is now on display in the Smithsonian Institution. But today would have been very easy for anything, anything, it would have been dead simple. We didn't even have motion control rails, there were scaffolding bars with a chap pushing them along saying, nah, 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 mate, you've got to do it smoother, right? <laughs> so when you complain about your CGI budget, don't, okay? And, um, and so all that shots of the spacecraft were basically a dolly being pushed with a good steady hand underneath the bloody model. So don't complain about your budget, okay? And um, uh, the, uh, so it was all actually manual. It was all by hand. It was all hand-tooled and hand-made. And, uh, but in a funny kind of way, you get very um, clever with a very little amount of money, you know? Because it makes you think. There's a big lesson there somewhere, actually. Um, <laughs> a, a, in fact, a, a good example on that was uh, Les tried desperately, had no money left, and it was hi up to him to make the model of the planet. And I walked in this uh, terrible little stage, well, it's not terrible, actually, Bray Studios, and uh, midwinter, which the heating had gone off. It was bloody terrible, actually. And uh, Les had done the alien planet, which they were going to walk over. And uh, it was about, alien planet was about from me to the piano. And so the mountains were about a foot high. And uh, I looked at Les and said, it ain't going to work, is it? I mean, we put a camera down there and tried to track through it. It was ridiculous. It was like, you know, it looked terrible. So we sat staring at the model and the big croissant, which is what I call the croissant, the big alien spacecraft, <laughs> and said, uh, Jesus, <laughs> Jesus, you know. Um, and I said, anybody got a home video kit? And these are just about the advent of home video cameras. And uh, at home, uh, eight mil. And they said, I got eight mil, I've got a video camera, so I get it. So I literally walked through the set with a video camera held down. approach the ship <laughs> and that's what you see on screen and it looks i thought tonight wow it looks amazing and uh <laughs> and, and it, that was basically because you know it would never have passed on anything but a very sophisticated cgi uh you know done deal and uh but it looked good because you saw it through ash's eyes through the headsets of the astronauts because it was being televised through the headsets back into the craft. So then Ash watches it and go, goes, my God. So it, oh, funny, is give it scale and credibility. Ridley Scott stated that, I've never liked horror films before, because in the end, it's always been a man in a rubber suit. Well, there's one way to deal with that. The most important thing in a film of this type is not what you see, but the effect of what you think you saw. Sigourney Weaver was cast as Ripley, the warrant officer aboard the Nostromo. Meryl Streep was considered for the role, but she was not contacted as her partner had recently died. Weaver, who had Broadway experience, but was relatively unknown in film, impressed Scott with her audition. She was the last actor to be cast for the film and performed most of her screen tests in studio as the sets were being built. The role of Ripley was Weaver's first leading role in a motion picture and earned her nominations for a Saturn Award for Best Actress and a BAFTA Award for Most Promising Newcomer to a Leading Film Role. Alien premiered on the 25th of May 1979. It was met with mixed reviews on release, but was a box office success, winning the Academy Award for Best Visual Effects, three Saturn Awards, and a Hugo Award for Best Dramatic Presentation. Critical reassessment since then has resulted in Alien being widely considered one of the greatest and most influential science fiction and horror films of all time. In 2002, Alien was deemed culturally, historically, or aesthetically significant by the Library of Congress 
and was selected for preservation in the United States National Film Registry. In 2008, it was ranked by the American Film Institute as the seventh best film in the science fiction genre, and as the 33rd greatest film of all time by Empire. The success of Alien spawned a media franchise of films, books, video games and toys, and propelled Weaver's acting career. The story of her character's encounters with the alien creatures became the thematic and narrative core of the sequels. The franchise continues to capture the imagination of audiences around the world with Alien Romulus due to release in cinemas in August 2024. The alien, do we show the spacecraft? What no. element um, did we, or are we going to emphasize in the, in the poster? In the yeah. Well, I think the trick is not to show you a beast unless you've got a shark, you know. And there was that other good poster, and everybody knows what a shark looks like, right? So I've never been able to go in the water again since, so, you know. Um, but uh, so the only thing there to do was use the shark, I think. In this instance, because the alien was unfamiliar, better keep him a secret until you see him behind Harry. Um, and what we thought was the egg was a good idea. It was kind of strange. And I think that this is the best linkage I've ever had between the opening credits titles in the movie and the poster. I said, I wanted like a hieroglyphic. And so they said, mm, OK, went away. And what they came up with were these strange little notches that could be fall between either being a spacecraft readout or some kind of digital clock or a hieroglyphic. And uh, that's what I got. I thought it was really good. Now, because you have such a background in commercials, do you find yourself wanting to get involved in things like the marketing of the film, the trailers, or even the title? I mean, really intimately involved in the title design for your films? Uh, yeah, but, you know, I always try to, and there's never time, because you're all buried either cutting, mixing, ADRing, or something. And, but, yes, I do get as much as I can involved in the process. But I think, you know, film, poster work, film marketing is a specialist thing. It's not, it's somehow different from advertising. Advertising is a different deal. I think we have time for a few questions from the audience, for Mr. Scott. Yes, right there. Um, how long did it take you to storyboard the entire film? Because I heard you had done that. And how long was your shooting schedule? Uh, I storyboarded the whole thing in three weeks. Um, and actually double the budget. So the value of uh, when I used to be in art school, and, uh, my old buddies who were then lawyers, solicitors, or teachers, uh, one of them says to me, hi, you're still pushing a pencil. I said, yeah, that's what I'm doing. And um, I still find the value of everything I learned at art school, I use every day now. And uh, so I'm able to sit down and do fairly, you know, significant boards. And boards are useful to me because it helps me to think. It's a bit like having a blank sheet of paper getting stuck, getting writer's block basically, and you just start, you start writing or you start drawing and it evolves. So I had the script and um, budget was 4.2, I think. And I said, uh, what are you gonna do? I said, I'm gonna go back to London. I'm gonna think about it on paper, come back with something specific in about three weeks to a month. And I returned with a board and they doubled the budget. So there's the value of a pencil, right? Yeah. Thank yeah, right you. here. Uh, really, I just uh, love your work, love all of it. Um, I had a question concerning the, I guess, lost airlock scene. They claim that that was never filmed. I, I was just curious if any of that was ever shot. Never got filmed. We couldn't, we couldn't do it, couldn't afford it. And besides, I couldn't work out in those days without CGI how to squeeze the body through a, you know, a hole that big. But they did it in number four. <laughs> <laughs> and paid the price. And he went white in the process, right? <laughs> I, I also had uh, one other small comment. I was wondering, um, towards the end when Ripley's running uh, for the, uh, the ladder, it appears that the cameraman bumps her and she kind of stops and hesitates before climbing up the ladder. I was curious if uh, that was true or not. Yeah, no, I, I, I'm, I operate, so I, I was the operator in all this film. So there's Ada Biddle and I tearing along there, first of all running backwards with Ripley running over us. And then we followed her, and actually what you see in the corridor, you've got a sharp eye, is one of the electricians standing there flapping a light effect, which is just a black flag doing that. And uh, we run straight into him. And well spotted, mate. 